Hi everyone. Um, first of all, let me apologise for the delay in this follow-up. Um, it's obviously a few months behind now, I think. Um, reason for it, I was trying to find enough time to go through the entire process of remodelling this crane. Turns out that that wasn't going to be possible, so instead I'm actually just going to go through the step-by-step -step process of how I went about making it without actually going through and creating the individual geometry because a lot of it's fairly re repetitious and you probably won't get a lot out of it so it's probably a better uh, approach just to go through how I went about and the order of how I went about modelling everything. Um, the first thing I might say is that I modelled this all based off a PDF image I got off a website so I basically took that PDF and converted it to a JPEG and then imported it into Revit and then that used that as an underlay. I then had to scale it off um, to the appropriate size. And the first thing I started doing was in my reference level, I started setting out reference planes just to define the uh, overall size of the crane itself. Um, and then I went through and started creating extrusions for the various components based on the shape of the, the image below um, which I've obviously purged out now but you can see that's just simply an extrusion I've um, then for the front of it uh, it's out, extruded out in this plane and then in the front view look at the left view I've created two void extrusions out in this plane and over here um, and for each of the wheels I've just modelled up all the axles independently and then for the wheels I just did one and then copied them around and the extension bars again they're just an extrusion um, for this example I didn't actually bother making these adjustable because for my purposes <coughs> I didn't need the crane to drive around the site I just needed to sit in one spot and pick things up and move them <coughs> in my animation <coughs> okay so feel free to ask any questions on those um, when I do post this video um, so the next step was all the movable components um, so I knew that this all had to pivot so therefore I needed to make that a separate family which I've, I've kind of run through how everything was broken down um, and as I said I had to double nest this to get the rotation axes to work in the right position because if I just loaded this particular family into the main um, into the main family um, for some reason the rotation axis didn't actually go off the origin point um, which was this point here so I had to yeah, double nest it in order to get get it to origin in the right correct in the correct position so as you can see in this one I've simply modeled up all this space stuff like I did in the main family through an extrusion out in this direction and some voids running through in the other direction to cut out the various sections. I've linked each one of these to various material parameters like so. So to do that you simply select the geometry that you created, hit the associate family parameter button and I've chosen to add a parameter, given it a name left them all as type parameters and grouped it under materials and finishes and I did the same for the body, the glazing and the undercarriage okay um, so all that bottom section was done as extrusion you can see there's a void there cutting out where the actual arm swing arm sits alright so that's that level moving down to the next level Alright, in this particular one is where I've done most of the work. So if we expand this out, the first thing I did 
here. And I've probably gone a bit overboard. I probably could have made this a little bit easier. But I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so the first thing I knew is the pivot point for the arm is actually 900 um, above where it actually sits on the main tray of the truck. So I added a reference plane down here and constrained it at 900 by adding a dimension and locking it. The next thing I knew is I wanted this arm to be adjustable. So to do that, I put in a reference line. Now I'll just go through the process of how I've constrained my reference line by putting in another one. So I'm just going to quickly put in a reference plane over here and over here just to show you. Oops, let's undo that and make it horizontal. Oh, I'm going to put two there. And I'm going to put in a reference line and I'm going to put it on center front back will do. So I'm going to put my reference line in here, like that. So the first thing I wanted to do with my reference line, which isn't a reference line, let's try again. That's better. Uh, that's a bit of a bug in Revit that I've noticed that if the work plane is not set and you click reference line and it prompts for the reference line, the first line you draw will be a model line and not a reference line. So I generally need to just delete that and try again. Um, so I've drawn it going from the end point um, outwards. Now the thing with a reference line is, and uh, the difference between a reference line and a reference plane is our reference line has an end point that we can control, which makes it perfect for using uh, making parametric angles. So now I need to control the end point, and I want to lock it in at this origin here. So to do that, I'm going to use my annotate tool and oops sorry I'm going to use modify tool and I'm going to use the align command and I'm going to align and use my tab key to cycle through and as you can see that's the end point of the line and I'm going to lock that to that plane and then for likewise I'm going to do the same in the other direction okay so now I've constrained that line to pivot around that particular point the next thing I did was add a dimension, an angular dimension, from that line down to the horizontal reference plane. And I've simply made a new parameter. In my case I called it main boom angle, but I'll go through the process again. Okay. And all I did was that. And the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to control how long my line was. So I'm going to dimension along this line, use my tab key again to pick the end point and the other end point to cycle through that. And I could call, I just called them various extension numbers, but we could just call this length. Okay. And the once I had my framework up, I always flex things. And by flexing, I mean I go into my family types and I change some of the values. So let's go 63, let's go 5600. Okay, so you can see it's all adjusting as expected. So I'm just going to undo all of that because I've already obviously already got that framework set up. Um, the next thing I needed to do was start associating some geometry to that. So you can see I've got a number of sweeps in here, oh sorry, extrusions set up in here for the various um, segments. Okay. Um, and the way I went about creating those is I went to solid form extrusion and I went to pick a plane and I set my reference line here as the work plane. Um, and then I simply went through and drew the various pieces
like that. Um, and then I constrained each of those to the to the various points. So I obviously needed this end of the reference line, or this line here, to constrain to the end of the reference line. So I did that by selecting the endpoint and then constraining that line to that. I actually put some fixed dimensions going from the reference line out to here, and another one going out to there. Um, that obviously didn't get the right bit. Make sure I pick the right line. So that's the extrusion shape hold, that's the line. Okay. And then finally I dimensioned from the endpoint of the reference line up to my sketch line. And for instance this one would be called, and I added a parameter for this and called it extension one. Okay, again I'm just going to, and then I chose to finish sketch. But I'm just going to cancel that just for so I can go in and just show you the actual settings that I used.